don't know if it's the weather shift or I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah, I've been congested all week. So no worries. Do you sound great? So I've, okay. I've gone ahead and I've started the recording because it's, I believe it's 11 or 11 five in central standard time, but um, nine Oh five where you are. Um, Love it. So we can go ahead and get started. Let's do it. So good morning, everybody. I believe most of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, my name is D. Wilmore. I'm the managing broker and head of brokerage for Radius. Thanks so much for uh, participating and taking some time to uh, talk a little bit about working with buyers and how that landscape may be changing for some of you. Now, make sure you open up your chat box because we'll be utilizing the chat box. Um, specifically, here's our first opportunity at a chat box. How many of you are primarily buyer's agents that you work more with buyers than you do with um, uh, listing properties on the market? All right, Tim, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're primarily a buyer's agent, this is really aimed at you. Um, but more specifically, uh, it's aimed at all of us for really kind of taking a look at our business models and looking at how we function from a day to day. You know, quite honestly, we're faced with challenges each and every day in this business. And this business is ev ever evolving. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm almost 30 years in this business. This, this coming 2024 will be my 29th year in this business, which seems almost impossible because I'm only 35. So, you know, do the math on that, right? But um, I've seen a couple of significant changes since I've been in business. Uh, when I first got into this business, this was a proprietary business um, to where there was no technology uh, that affected us in such a deep way. Um, there was no internet, as a matter of fact, when I got into this business. And so a couple of things have evolved over time. One of those things being buyer agency. Uh, buyer agency really wasn't um, really wasn't a thing as it is now. Buyer agency is relatively new. I'm going to say, I, I'll say as long as 20 years, but more specifically 15. It was a different process when we first got into the business. Um, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that today, but I want to address um, some brief concerns in regards to uh, the lawsuit and then talk really more about how you can um, articulate your value so that it's not a thing for your buyers. It's, you know, so that it's just business as usual. So that's kind of what you can expect today. Let me, uh, let me make sure my screen is working. Everybody see my screen okay? Anybody having difficulties? Right on. Very good. All right. As you know, every presentation you'll ever see with me always starts off with a quote. Um, only because that those are things, it, recognize, it helps us to recognize that other people are in the same place or have been in the same place as we are. People have the same questions or, you know, uh, same ideas of how to move forward, um, which is why I love quotes. One quote that I really that really stood out for me, uh, particularly in our given uh, climate, is since we cannot change reality, let us change the eyes which see reality. Um, and the reason why that really stood out to me is right now there's this perception that's going on in our industry. Uh, you know, are you guys familiar with the story of Chicken Little? Doom and gloom, the sky is falling, right? None of those things are true. But if you think about our um, customers that we serve, to the general public, those lay people who are not real estate practitioners, they have no clue as to what the hell's going on. They're hearing bits of uh, bits of sound, you know, through different media outlets that say this thing and that thing, and they're hearing it even from us as practitioners that, oh my God, the world is ending, right? And none of that's true. So. This was something that really stood out to me because we can't change reality, but we can help people see a different version of what's really going on, more of a truer version than what's actually existing right now. So that's kind of our basis um, for communication today. Um, so things that you can expect today. We're going to talk a little bit about the history or the evolution of the Real Estate Commission. Uh, we'll, I, I want to stress this. The verdict just came down roughly two weeks ago. As with anything, um, there's an appeals process. 
And NAR and uh, some of the defendants are definitely appealing this process. Keep in mind, uh, there's an original lawsuit that started or originated sometime near the end of 18 or 19. Uh, it takes four or five years for an appeal process to happen. So you're not going to see any immediate cash awards or anything like that. You know, the legal system is swift uh, on some levels and very slow moving on most of levels. So um, there are no immediate changes. But again, the purpose of where we are today is to really to get you forward thinking about change that may or more than likely will happen, okay? The more we're ahead of the curve, the better we are as practitioners, the better experience we can give. Um, again, we'll talk about the lawsuits in brief, um, and then we'll talk about buyer agency and the corresponding documents that help us to support our value proposition as we have those um, sometimes difficult conversations with our buyers. Uh, and then finally, scripting. I promised you guys that we would really um, kind of dive into scripting. Um, a few of you have asked me for scripts for quite some time. I'm very slow moving when it comes to specific scripts around um, a particular change or a particular um, reference to something. And the reason being is I want to make sure that your language is on point. And certainly there will be some opportunities for each and every one of you um, to kind of craft your own script. Um, hopefully some of what I share will allow you to kind of at least create a framework. Um, I will share all of the corresponding documents that I uh, referenced or talk about in today's meeting with you. All you need to do is just email me post this session and I will e email each and every one of you the entire folder, okay? So, excuse me for one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so let's kind of dive into it. So I'm sure some of you are already familiar with the history of real estate as a whole, but more specifically, how did we come up, how, how did we come into our present state of commission, right? Some of you already know, even though um, com residential commissions are 100% negotiable and it's stated on every single document that you guys ever sign, every purchase agreement, you know, it should be conversations we're having with both our sellers and our buyers. Let's face it, most of us don't because we're scared about that conversation with money. Um, but, you know, how did we actually come into the present state of where we are? Where did that 6% come from? You know, why is that? Why was that even a quote unquote standard? Or why was that at least talked about on a regular basis? So the National Association of Realtors, which is what we know it as now, was founded uh, in, two, in 1908 uh, as the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges, uh, day after my birthday, as a matter of fact, but I'm not that old. Um, in, in 1913, uh, the organization established a uniform commission framework for, for real estate agents. So it was kind of a Wild West show when it first started. Realtors were very, uh, real estate agents were very... Um, utilitarian when real estate first started. They did everything. They were notary. They were insurance. They were your barber. They may have been your grocer. I mean, you know, we we started off the way the, you know, the United States kind of evolved and grew. It was a very homegrown, homespun thing. But because there was so many national um, real estate agents um, they thought, let's let's put some form and function to this. And they created a framework around it. Um, and again, it was known as the National Association of Real Estate Exchanges, and then subsequently the National Association of Realtors in the 50s. But in 1920, the typical cost of purchasing a house was a little over $6,200, about $6,300. And sellers were generally paying about 2.5% of commission, um, right? It's a cost to pay to play, so to speak. So the agent received a commission of $157, uh, which equated to that 2.5% uh, of that sale price. And that amount was divided between two agents. So each agent made about 78 bucks. Can you guys imagine getting a $78 commission today? You're like, okay, I got lunch money today, or I, I can put gas in my tank. But each agent was making about, you know, $78, $79 for your average $6,000 sale. Um, uh, Excuse me. Give me one second, guys. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> so, um, uh, 
you know, the um, so the commission itself represented roughly 7.3 percent of the ha annual household income, um, which seemed to be a lot back then. Again, one hundred fifty seven dollars is, you know, seven percent of your annual uh, your gross annual. You know, it seems like nothing today, but was quite a bit back then. I mean, you know, you you figure people worked all day for a nickel. You know, some people made 90 cents and you were doing well or $15 a week. So it was a very different time back then. Um, what is going on with my slides? Uh, give me one second. I'm having, there we go. That's what it's doing. All right. All right. It's me, guys. <laughs> you guys wouldn't be a part of this if there wasn't a technical glitch somewhere. Okay. All right. There we go. So by 1940, um, you know, increased development led to more communities, more homes, and that raised the demand of real estate agents. We went through the industrial age. Um, cars were very ubiquitous in everyone's lifestyle at that point. You know, people were on the go. People had an opportunity to move away from uh, metro areas, you know, prominent cities and maintain lifestyles in suburban communities. So there was, uh, you know, uh, the, the real estate commission doubled from two and a half percent to five percent, and in some cases six. So, and a part of that was because realtors or real estate agents did a lot of work then, right? There was no database, there was nothing that was standardized. So, realtors were going house to house. You know, that's where door knocking came into play, right? Realtors were going house to house. They were being belly to belly, eye to eye with everybody that they met. They were driving from town to town or they were walking through neighborhoods, you know. So there was a lot of work involved in transacting real estate at that time. So, you know, because there was no technology or there was no standardized database, it was expensive for a real estate practitioner to actually function in business at that time. Um, you know, cost of gas, you know, again, you know, moving around from town to town, all that kind of stuff. So um, that's why they felt that you know, a 5% or even a 6% commission supported that agent's effort. Well, by 1950, and all of you are familiar with the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is kind of the basis for all of the lawsuits that we're hearing about. But in 1950, the Supreme Court um, found that brokers were price fixing, and that was in violation of antitrust laws. And what I mean by price fixing is all of us on this call all agree that you know, it, it, this is an example, by the way. All of us agree that commissions should be 8%. Everybody agree? Yes, we all agree. That's price fixing. And that's essentially what brokers across the United States did. Is they said, hey, look, we're going through all this stuff. We are working our butts off. We should be getting more money. It should be at least X, right? It should be double the amount of what we've been getting, right? Can't make it on 78 bucks. So, you know, they essentially colluded to say we deserve this amount of money, kind of like any strike or any uh, uh, labor union that says we deserve more money and here's why these are the things that we do. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled that to be in violation of antitrust laws. So brokers uh, adapted in a way. So rather than <clears throat> you know demanding that it's a 6% commission, they suggested the amount of 6% in order to comply with the Supreme Court's decision in the early 50s. And they, you know, that lasted for a good long time, you know, all through the 60s and 70s. And in the 80s was when we really started using language about standardized commission of 6%. And that weaved its way into the public lexicon, right? You know, all of us, when we first got into business, we all knew 6%, right? Or at least most of us knew 6% or thereabouts. Um, and so it weaved its way into the public lexicon, but some of the things that we did to kind of overcome that was on all of our documents, we let it be known that uh, commissions are 100% negotiable. And again, that falls within that, you know, it's a suggested amount um, bucket, but the reality was that was, you know, kind of what we demanded as an industry. So now fast forward to today, 2023. We've been embroiled in the process of lawsuits in this century since 2000, or at least the threats of. Um, you know, quite frankly, this, I can, as I can recall, dates back to 2000. You know, there's been lots of 
the federal government has targeted this quite a bit. But keep in mind, the National Association of Realtors is a very powerful lobbying organization. And even though each state has its own association of real realtors, this lawsuit isn't against California Association of Realtors, or the Florida Association of Realtors, or the Texas Association of Realtors, or Georgia, or any of other states. This is squarely aimed at the National Association of Realtors. The crux of the lawsuit basically talks about the collusion between the National Association of Realtors, franchise or corporate brokerages, and the MLS and the MLS's assertion that the buyer's agent be compensated by the listing agent via the MLS. So that's really what it's about, is about these two systems that um, are um, essentially taking more money from a consumer than is what's necessary. Um, and again, lots of legal precedents, lots of challenges on both sides. So that's why I said, this is gonna go for a long time. So again, we talked about in 1920, the average commission was seven uh, was um, seven point three percent of the average household income, uh, and that average household income was about twenty one hundred and sixty dollars a year. So it kind of tells you where we were in twenty twenty two. Fast forward to twenty twenty two, the national average household income was um, seventy four thousand five hundred eighty dollars, and home prices were averaging around four hundred thirty thousand dollars. That's about the median home price across the United States. So that took took roughly 28.8% of household income, making an increase from 7.3 to 28.8% of the household wage. Guys, that's huge. That's a huge number. I mean, you know, to sell my house, you know, almost 30% of what I make annually goes to pay for Realtors Commission. Um, so it's caused the public to be up in arms. I think you all know, ever since we hit the internet age, which is late eight, late 90s, early 2000s, um, we've gone into a very self-service mode across all industries. Real estate is no different than any other industry. We can Travel agents disappeared in the early 2000s because, hell, I can book uh, my vacation on Expedia or Priceline or any of these other things. So real estate was bound to uh, have that experience. But we all know that real estate is not a sales business. It's a relationship-based business. We spend all of our time developing relationship. We don't sell houses. None of you have ever sold a house. There is never an opportunity for you to take someone somewhere and convince them to buy something that they're not feeling emotionally from a residential side. It's different in, if you're an investor, but a consumer has to be invested in the neighborhood and they have to feel a particular way about the thing that we're showing them, right? So we don't actually sell houses. We help people to make informed decisions about what their next steps should look like, okay? So as we get into the one that just uh, concluded, which is the Stitzer Barnett class action lawsuit. Uh, again, its it, its core tenet was about that we violated um, antitrust laws by establishing this commission um, sharing system. And again, that's between mostly the MLSs and NAR. But you know, it enjoined listing agents and buyers agents to essentially um, conspire to um, have a particular commission wage. Um, and it wasn't very transparent to the public. Um, so that's kind of what the crux of the lawsuit is. Um, the Stitzer Barnett lawsuit challenges NARS policy that mandates brokers to compensate a buyer's agent via MLS. Um, and it violates you know, antitrust in their idea. And obviously a jury found NAR and several um, very large key defendants guilty um, and awarded them $1.78 billion in damages. Now, if those damages are what's called trebled, in other words, they're tripled from a legal definition, that could push the damage settlement over $5 billion. Now, with any pending lawsuits, there's one that was, there was a lawsuit that was filed immediately after this decision happened uh, on October 31st, which is what, is that Halloween or is it 30th Halloween? Whatever Halloween is, I guess it's the 31st, right? Um, which is Gibson versus NAR and 
other defendants that named Compass and um, EXP and several other players, right? And it's clear that there is a target, right? The uh, Department of Justice is involved and the general consensus or feeling and sentiment is, is that they're trying to kill NAR because they feel that NAR has created this anti-competitive environment which doesn't allow our business model to flourish. Um, and, you know, again, none of us are legal scholars. I know I'm certainly not. I'm a consumer of this information just like the rest of you. That's why I said, you know, there's nothing immediate that we need to worry about per se, but recognize that smart people are making fundamental changes right now. And when I say smart people, I'm talking about, you know, NAR itself has now allowed um, the opportunity for um, a seller to not have to pay um, a commission to a buyer's agent. So, you know, that's a big thing. That's a change that NAR electively did uh, preemptively of this lawsuit. And um, so it's those little things that are happening which is the reason why we're having this session today is, you know, today is all about helping you all to prepare for changes that are probably inevitably coming when is a different story, but you know, it makes sense to absolutely be armed with the right tools now so that it's not a thing. And again, these are subtle shifts in conversations, guys, subtle shifts in conversations. Um, the real effort is to kill NAR because absolutely, because they have, NAR is a powerful, a very powerful lobbying organization. I mean, it's been compared to the mafia or a cartel. I've heard many different <laughs> statements about NAR um, over the years, and it is extremely powerful. It is extremely powerful. And so um, anytime there's a system of power, people are always trying to bust you know, that power structure. And a lot of that is what may be happening right now. Um, you know, again, we're blamed for everything. So, you know, good call out, Scott, for sure. Trying to kill NAR is really the effort right now. Um, and of course, I'm a little biased because I'm in this industry. This is how I feed my family, you know, as are all of you. So we should be concerned a bit about what's happening with one of our parents, right? But you also have several companies that are contracting or moving away from NAR. Um, as a matter of fact, there's been a number of companies that have pulled out from membership to NAR. Uh, it started with Redfin um, a month or two back, and then you've had several companies follow the same line, more specifically corporate style companies. As a matter of fact, Anywhere, which used to be a brand called Relogy, which houses uh, companies like Better Homes and Gardens, Corcoran, um, Sotheby's, Coldwell Banker, et cetera. It's, it's probably the biggest conglomerate of real estate uh, brokerages in the nation. They've all elected, and Remax is the other one, they've all electively said, hey, look, as part of this settlement, we get it. You know, hey, we're going we're gonna to pay you some money up front. Uh, anywhere uh, preemptively settled uh, in advance of this lawsuit for about $85 million dollars and Remax settled for about $55 million. But some of the language they both instituted, which is they would uh, arbitrarily create some fundamental changes in the way they did real estate practice. And one of those, which was, and Scott brought this up earlier, the use of the word free. Hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Buyer, you don't want to have to worry about a commission because my service is free. I get paid by the seller. Language like that that continued to promote um, a certain type of inequity, um, which is what came to light. They moved away from that. And they also um, decided not to have their corporate owned entities um, mandatorily be a part of the National Association of Realtors. So you've got large companies, and there, there's more to it than this, but I won't get into it in today's session. But you've got lots of companies that have pulled away from NAR. NAR has had some le le uh, leadership troubles. Uh, of late, you know, they had a an internal sexual scandal and a number, number of other knucklehead things. So, you know, companies have been trying to distance themselves from um, from NAR um, because, you know, the environment is quote unquote toxic and, um, and dangerous to consumers and such. So all those things are really happening in real time. And again, I can't stress enough, as Scott's saying, a lot of it is, you know, a power buster move on so many different respects.
So again, all of these attack our real estate commission models. Most of you wake up in the morning and do business as usual. You start to scour through the MLS, you're looking for your buyer clients and you're looking at for sale. And you know, honestly, all of you, or at least most of you were probably trained in a way that you're looking for properties that potentially have the highest payout to you as well. You know, if we're if we're being honest, right? This is how you feed your family. This is not a non -for not for profit business. This is for a profit business. So a lot of us kind of look for things that potentially might pay a little bit more money. You know, that's just kind of the truth of it. So when we talk about buyer's agency, that's the thing we talk about, but don't really pull the covers back very often. I'm a big proponent, big fan of. Uh, articulating very highly what buyer's agency is. Uh, I know this may seem like, you know, first day 101, what is buyer's agency? But let's just clearly spell it out. Buyer's agency involves a buyer and their real estate agent where the agent aids the buyer in locating and purchasing a home, negotiating on their behalf and representing their interests. So I want to stop right there, negotiating on the buyer's behalf and representing their interests. All too often, there's an assumption, and this is part of where the lawsuit sits as well, which is if I'm being paid by the seller and the seller is the one who controls the money, am I really having my best interest represented by a buyer who's essentially by a buyer's agent who is essentially being paid by the seller, right? The seller's putting the bill, you know, why wouldn't I have a subtle allegiance to the seller, right? And, you know, again, there's a word that I want to throw out to all of you. All of you are familiar with it. It's the word fiduciary. We have a, a fiduciary relationship is a relationship of trust. We have an imperative um, to our customer that we represent. In this case, we're talking about buyers to maintain a fiduciary relationship, meaning we're putting that buyer's interest above our own. We're representing that buyer solely um, as a single agency. And we don't have an interest in what the seller does, you know, because the seller is not our customer. The buyer is our customer. All too often, though, we will bend over to appease the seller because at the end of the day, we know that the seller pays our bill. And that's not all of you. I'm just kind of giving you guys a little industry perspective that I'm sure all of you already know. So that buyer's agency is a fiduciary relationship. Any agency, by the way, is a relationship of trust, that fiduciary capacity. But it's important that you establish that agency relationship right away. And why should this be any different than when, if you're a listing agent, uh, why should this be any different that the buyer just kind of has a choice to do whatever, whenever, and you've got no control over that? There used to be this old saying in this business, buyers are liars. Buyers are not liars. They're just not well-informed because we as practitioners never or usually never have to articulate our value to a buyer. And that's what we're going to talk about now is how do we actually articulate our value to a buyer, right? Again, most of you raised your hands that you're working as buyer's agents. So let's talk a little bit about how we can fortify or create a stronger dynamic within our buyer relationships, okay? Uh, so in California, there are several documents, uh, and again, I'll share all of these documents um, uh, uh, via email, post this, or I can uh, drop, no, I'll just share them via email. I was going to say I could drop a link, but uh, uh, <clears throat> so there's the buyer representation and broker agreement. And essentially this document, and I'm going to summarize these documents in brief, um, the buyer representation and broker agreement is a document that says, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, listen, I'm going to do some work for you, and you're going to be the person responsible for paying me. Um, I, I want you, again, post this class to really review these documents to the fullest so that you have a full and fundamental understanding of how they work. These documents will absolutely save you on a day-to-day. -day. They are no different than a listing agreement if you went out for a listing, right? You would want to be protected if you went out for a listing, wouldn't you? You'd want to make sure that, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm going to do all this work. Am I going to get paid, right? And I don't want to make it all about the money because, again, I did say it's about the relationship, but you guys are working hard for the things that you do, and you should be 
be compensated for it. And these are supportive documents that will allow you to get paid. And if you understand the dynamics of these documents, both individual and um, in full, um, it should be no problem in terms of conversation post, okay? Um, so you've got the uh, buyer representation and broker agreement. That is pretty much the one that you're really going to want to uh, immerse yourself in and use on a regular basis. Now, I know the initial argument with some of you stands in the fact that you're saying, well, look, if I do this, my buyer's not going to want to work with me. You know, I'm forcing them to sign something and I haven't even found them anything to buy yet, right? Again, any relationship starts with an agreement, a mutual agreement, a bilateral agreement. Um, you're agreeing to uh, help the buyer find a property for sale and the buyer's agreeing to compensate for you, compensate you. It's no different than a listing agreement, which is a listing agreement essentially does the same thing. Hey, I'm agreeing to market your property and, you know, uh, elicit people to facilitate the sale of your property at the best price for you with the least amount of inconvenience. And you're agreeing to pay me. That's that bilateral agreement that we all function from. There's another document called the Anticipated uh, Broker Compensation Disclosure. Again, this is a supportive document that allows the buyer to understand, hey, look, you know, my fee is this, right? And this is part of articulating your value. If most of you don't know what you're worth per hour, you don't know how to articulate your value. All of you should be able to say, I'm worth this much money per hour, no matter what your number is. That's what you should be able to articulate. That's your value. Um, and so that's that thing that you're actually selling because they're not buying the company. They're not buying your brand. They're buying, buying you. That's that relationship piece. So there's the anticipated broker compensation disclosure. Um, again, that's one of those supportive documents that will allow the buyer to understand, hey, this is my fee. Um, the seller is only offering, let's say, if the seller was offering 1%. My fee is 3% for doing what I do. Um, you're agreeing to compensate me for the additional amount of money that the broker is not, pay, uh, that the seller is not going to provide, okay? Uh, and then there's the buyer transactional advisor, which is in, uh, uh, an advisory document that simply says, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, you may be responsible for the commission. You know, sometimes the seller pays, sometimes you pay. Um, and by the way, all of these forms um, were actually drafted in 2019-ish um, and 2020-ish, and they've been out since um, uh, December of 2022. So they've been around for a while, but they've been in the works for an awfully long time. Remember I said, these lawsuits are not new. One was a uh, an appeal that now came to fruition and was able to move forward. So these are not new. These are things we've talked about for a while, but again, we make changes as our ne as they become necess necessary. And then, you know, the one thing that it goes hand in hand with the buyer representation and broker agreement is Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. If you and I find that we're not working successfully together, we can go ahead and terminate our relationship, just like a listing agreement, right? In a listing agreement, again, if you guys keep in mind, these are all bilateral contracts, meaning you know each is making a promise to do a thing. But if the relationship just isn't working, we don't want to be in a bad relationship, right? Who wants to be in a bad marriage, right? So you know, is there a way for us to dissolve what we've agreed to do? And that form would be the cancellation of buyer representation. So if you're worried at all about, oh my God, you know they're going to hate me and they're not going to want to do business with me because I'm making them sign something, you you probably should let that jump out of your head right now. Sorry, guys. Excuse me for one second. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then there's uh, the notice of broker-involved properties. Um, kind of same thing, which is, you know, if if there is any ownership aspect for me as a broker or for you as an agent, um, things like that. And I won't delve into that too much right now. And then um, seller payment to buyer's broker. Again, if the seller is going to cooperate or pay any monies, um, this is a form that kind of spells out or outlines what that actually looks like. Um, and again, these are all California forms. So what I just went over were California forms. Again, these will all be in the folder that I share post-meeting. So I want you to take a look at all the samples. And most of these are in your, all of these, as a matter of fact, are in your, um, 
are in your car forms library, okay? Uh, in Florida, Florida also has a document, which is the exclusive buyer broker agreement, uh, the single agent agreement. That's been around for an awfully long time. Uh, that form has existed in Florida for eight, eight years or so, eight or nine years or something like that. Um, that form is, is going through a process of change as do all of these forms to adopt to the current line, uh, uh, language and climates. Um, but that exclusive broker agreement is the same thing as the uh, buyer uh, broker representation for California. And it simply says, as a matter of fact, in that Florida document, it even establishes a retainer process. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'm going to be doing some work for you. You know, in order for me to do my best job, let's get this money piece out of the way. You're agreeing to hire me. You know, I, you're, you're putting me on retainer to work for you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. And guys, the minute we establish agency, and part of the definition of establishing agency is any time the conversation becomes less than casual. Now, what do I mean when I say less than casual? A casual conversation is this, hey, Scott, how you doing? How's real estate? And Scott says, oh, real estate is great, D. Wow, you should jump in. And the minute I say, hey, Scott, well, listen, I've got this property at 1234 Main Street. I'd really like to know what the value of that is. Now, that's what's called a less than casual conversation. Scott has engaged me in a fiduciary relationship, a relationship of trust, meaning I'm working for Scott irrespective of how I get paid or if I get paid. Because Scott has said, I want to know about this thing. And because we are licensed practitioners, I've now entered in an agreement of work. You know, there's no discussion of conversation or of conversation of compensation, but I've entered into an agreement of work and I have to fulfill that if I say, sure, Scott, let me let me look that up for you. Let me get back to you. I'll email you. That's a fiduciary relationship. So that retainer piece that I'm talking about is, you know, an opportunity to say, look, you know, Scott, I don't do this for free. Not that you would use that language, but it lets Scott know, you know, Scott, I'm I'm a business owner. This is what I do for a living. This you don't go to your doctor and go, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Doctor, you know, or Dr. So and so. I've had the, you're at a party. I've got this pain in my knee. You know, what should I do about it? Does the doctor say to you, hey, pull your pants down. Let's have a look at it right in the middle of a party. Of course not. They make an appointment, but they establish a system of work and they're not doing it for free. They say, you should come by my office, make an appointment. Let's take a look at that thing. But it's probably not going to be for free. And so your work shouldn't be for free either. So that's what that Florida brokerage form establishes is exactly that, that agreement of work or that fiduciary relationship establishment between the buyer and the buyer's uh, broker or the buyer's agent. Texas also has a similar form. It's called the Residential Buyer Tenant Representation Agreement, which came out in um, July of 2022. So it's had some revamps and revisions, and that's the most current iteration. But again, all of these forms are subject to change based on um, some of the dynamics of these lawsuits um, and our uh, and our lobbying organizations trying to proactively make adjustments. Again, I referenced as we started this, there was an antitrust lawsuit all the way back in 1950, right? And I suspect that we'll probably have them as we exist as an organization overall or as an industry. You know, but you know, again, you can't have an industry this old without it's a hundred and what 20 years old almost, a little less than 117, 118 years old. You can't have an industry this old, a ship this big without some adjustments along the way. And these are some adjustments that we're going through right now in real time. As a matter of fact, in Washington state, Washington state was so proactive, so preemptive of this, they changed their model way back in 2019 and it became effective in 2022. But in October, 2019, the Northwest uh, Multiple Listing Service between, became the first in the US to disclose and allow its members to publish a seller compensation to buyer broker and remove the mandate for sellers to pay buyer brokers. Now, somebody had asked me in a, a different session, could I provide statistical data on commissions? Well, when I did my deep dive, when I did my research, of course there's no statistical data because they don't want the illusion of we're tracking what an average commission would be. So there was no data, but the one data that I was able to glean, which is you know their sales, haven't varied in um, 
uh, a seven year history, right? You know, you you based on seasonality, based on market conditions and all those factors aside, you know, their sales buy side and sell side are just as robust. And I'm quite sure buyer's agents aren't working for free in the state of Washington. But Washington state, you know, doesn't require its members to be uh, a part of uh, a state or national association. Um, there is free trade, quote unquote, which is kind of, again, the crux of this lawsuit, which allows um, these agents to function and create uh, their own representation agreement or language. So seller compensation to the buyer broker is clearly listed on the first page of their purchase and sale agreement uh, uh, where it can be agreed upon or adjusted by the buyer. Part of the thing that happened for the buyer was the buyer said, hey, all this time, I've never had any say so in how I want to compensate my agent. Hell, my agent sucks. I don't want to pay him anything. Any of you ever been to a restaurant and had a bad server and that tip comes around or that check comes around and they're all smiles and want a tip? Well, you know, some of us, some practitioners are not the best and buyers are not happy, but they're still getting paid. Washington State removed that and they said, hey, you know what, you're paying that buyer 3%. I don't, you know, I don't think so. So that can be adjusted via an addendum in Washington state. The compensation that the seller offers to the buyer will be a direct offer determined by the seller rather than the commission sharing between uh, the two brokerages. So what that means essentially is, yeah, you, you, you're representing me as the seller. Uh, I'm going to pay you 2%. And I'm going to pay the buyer's agent 1%, which now gives that buyer broker an opportunity to also negotiate with their buyer. Well, listen, my rate is, you know, two and a half percent. You know, the seller's only offering me one. Will you, I'm asking you to pay the other, you know, 1.5. Okay. So, you know, again, Washington state has been very ahead of the game. Um, they've really kind of uh, made sure that this language is very clear um, that it's very consumer friendly. There's lots of transparency. Um, and if Washington State has been doing this for over a year now successfully with no glitches, there's little chance that we're going to have glitches. Now, keep in mind, most of us are in very progressive states, California, uh, uh, Florida and Texas. Um, you know, so, again, these are big ships to move. But I want to make sure I'm removing the fear factor for most of you. Um, Again, Washington's been very successful at this over the last year or so with little to no glitches or hiccups. So keep that in mind. So as we talk about that, how do we adjust our language? What are the things that we need to do so that we a feel comfortable in knowing that um, uh, you know our language is clear and concise? and that we're representing our buyer's interest in the best way possible. So how do we open up a conversation around that? Uh, and again, um, I created a couple of uh, different scripts for you guys to kind of uh, take examples of so that you've at least got a structure for some talking points. I'm a big fan of scripts, guys. I, I always have been, always have been. I know I hear this a lot from agents. No, I kind of like to freestyle it, you know, and I, I like the conversations to be bespoke. I will say your entire life is scripted. Most of you don't recognize that from a behavioral standpoint, but from the language that we use to the way we use that language, believe it or not, that's all scripted. We learn how to speak a pattern of communication by rote. We learn different phrases by rote. That's why phrases are so regional or you know, uh, from uh, um, sometimes culture to culture is because we learn how to speak by rote. In other words, we use scripts. Most of you, I'm sure, watch movie or television, right? Netflix, those actors aren't freestyling it, right? They've learned language, but they've also learned how to emote that language to convey a particular emotion or a particular um, uh, message that they wanna send. That's the same with us, right? The reason why buyers uh, or why customers seem so adverse when we're using scripting is because we ourselves haven't perfected those scripts, right? It feels like we're being sold. You've all had that bad sales call where it's like, hello, my name is D. Wilmore. How are you today, right? Click, it's sales call right away. But the more uh, relaxed conversation we can have and having talking points to where we can drive the direction of the conversation, that's really what scripting is all about. So I tried to craft this in a way to where all of you can use this um, uh, or modify this to where it works for you. But this is a this is a good start for a baseline. 
Um, so that first page of scripting that I'll share with you guys, you know, how do I open up a conversation? Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Buyer, listen, you know, or I'm going to use Scott or Kathy's name. Hey, Kathy, you know, thanks for an opportunity to work with you. I'm really looking forward to helping you find, you know, your forever home. You know, I want to ensure that you fully understand, Kathy, you know, how I work and how I'll be compensated for the valuable services I'm going to provide to you. Um, in our market, it's it's typical for a buyer to pay the agent's commission, which allows us to work directly for you, Kathy. Um, and, you know, I want to make sure I have your best interest at heart. And see, I deliberately added stammers and pauses and stutters and you knows because that's the natural syntax of speaking. So when you guys are looking at scripting, use the core language, but layer in functional speak because that makes you sound more natural. And that's how you actually effectively use scripts, right? If you're reading it verbatim, right, you noticed I made some little changes, but I used the overall framework so that the messaging was clear and it felt very natural. So if I learn the framework uh, in depth, I can adjust this and be bespoke as I want, but the message is actually very pointed, very clear. So that's kind of how you open up a conversation. A lot of this is what's called assumptive language. And what assumptive language is, is I'm already assuming that Kathy's going to wanna to hire me and gonna to wanna to use me. So I'm just merely upselling my value proposition and why these things are happening and that I'll be explaining to her to make sure that everybody's clear and we can move forward effectively while still keeping her at the forefront, making her understand I've got her best interest in mind and this is why this conversation is happening. So how do we actually outline our value proposition? I'm being very mindful of time, guys. I know we're have a hard stop at 10, right? So uh, outlining your value proposition, again, a script that we can use for that is as your agent, uh, Kathy, and again, using someone's name allows the next seven to 10 seconds for Kathy to be paying full attention to me because I tapped her um, internal mental source that said, oh, you're talking to me, Kathy. Now Kathy's fully engaged in that conversation for a few more seconds, right? But Kathy, as your agent, um, you know, I bring a lot of expertise in the negotiating process. You know, I know this local market very well, and I have access to resources that can help to streamline what your experience is gonna look like. Um, and I'm dedicated to finding you the right home and guiding you through every step of the process. Again, that script I designed to make it about Kathy, but it's clearly explaining and articulating what I'm going to do, right? There's no confusion. There was no vague language um, you know, that Kathy could misinterpret and say, I, I, I still don't understand, what do you mean, right? And that's how you really wanna utilize scripts in an effective way. Um, I mentioned before, uh, there is not one single objection that is rational. Re objections are always irrational. There's nothing that can't be overcome, even money. When someone says, I don't think I can afford it, they're not telling you no, they're just saying, I can't do it right now. But we interpret those things as a no. They said they don't have money. That's a no. That's not a no. That's I can't do this right now. Okay. So an objection. Why should I pay the commission when the seller usually pays the commission? You might hear that, particularly since we're all used to that particular framework. So, you know, Kathy, I understand, you know, that paying a commission might seem unconventional, but uh, this you know, by you paying me, this arrangement ensures that I'm solely representing your interest, right? And, you know, not the sellers. My job is to work for you. So this way, there's no conflict of interest, right? Uh, you're my primary, you're, you're my primary purpose. And I'm incentivized to get you the best deal possible. You know, th that might seem a little bold for some of you. But again, Direct language is always the best language, always. You know, some of you may not agree with that. Some of you may want to skirt around it. And that's because you might feel uncomfortable in how you articulate who you are and why your services are valuable. Again, it goes back to, do you know how much you're worth per hour? If you don't know how much you're worth per hour, some of you may struggle with this. Another objection that you might run into, I'm already spending a lot on this purchase. I can't afford to pay a commission. How do we handle something like that? <clears throat> so, you know, Kathy, I completely understand your concerns about cost. You know, it makes perfect sense to me, but think about my commission as an investment in making sure you don't overpay for your, your replacement, for your home. 
You know, my negotiating skills alone can often save my clients more than the cost of my commission, right? Again, sounds very bold. Some of you may feel uncomfortable with that, right? But your business owners, that's your job is to be able to, you know, you, some of you may have heard this line, which is if I can't negotiate with you, how the heck am I going to negotiate with the seller, right? If I can't negotiate my commission with you, how am I going to negotiate with the seller or vice versa if you're the listing agent, but something like that. You know, this is this is kind of um, this is kind of a business where the brave survive, if that makes sense at all. The more direct, the more clear you are, the more concise you are, the more you're able to handle these types of objections with clear and specific language, the better it's going to be because it helps the buyer to understand that you're a professional, not just some key that I can manipulate and drive around and open doors for me, right? And it takes away the need for the buyer to have multiple parties attempting to represent them because now you're very clear about who I am. I'm saying to you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I am the professional and I can clearly show you why, right? And by the language I'm using with you right now, you're hiring me as a professional. We're going to make an agreement um, so that we each know what our responsibilities are in this relationship. Can't we just cut out the commission to lower the overall cost? You know, Kathy, while it might seem like eliminating uh, the commission would lower the cost, my role is actually pr to protect your financial interests. W without me as a committed agent, you might end up overpaying or missing important details in the contract. My job is to ensure that doesn't happen, right? Again, I'm articulating my value proposition while keeping Kathy's interest in mind. I'm continually reinforcing the fact of, Kathy, I work for you. Kathy, I work for you. Kathy, I work for you. I solely represent you, Kathy. That's your overall messaging. I'm char charging you because I'm working for you. I have your interest at heart. These are the things that I want you to know. I want to make sure you understand that. Um, I can find myself, I can find a home myself using online resources. You know, Kathy, it's true. There's a lot of online resources, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, you know, but there's a lot of information to sift through, right? As a professional, I can provide you curated options that match your specific needs and ensure that you're not missing out on any opportunities, including off-market inventory. Uh, so I've always used something similar to that, which is it's my job to, you know, I use it for listings primarily because I was a listing agent, but, you know, I, it's my job to understand the inventory both past and present, you know, and that includes off market. Um, and that lets them know that you're not just looking through the stuff that they can find on Zillow or whatever, uh, what other, whatever other aggregate site there is. It's letting them know that you're doing a process of work. Hey, I'm scouring through stuff that you wouldn't even have the opportunity to see because it's not in the open market for sale. That really indicates that you're doing a job above and beyond and you really do represent their best interest because it's true with the collapse of inventory, there actually may be um, a product, uh, a property that the buyer consumer is looking for that doesn't exist because you know, it's not on the open market, but it could be a seller who was on the market a while back who really wants to sell but couldn't find their price, okay? Uh, other agents have offered um, uh, to accept a lower commission. Why shouldn't I go with them? You know, that's a good question, Kathy. While some agents might offer a lower commission, it's important to consider uh, the value that you're receiving. My commitment is to you um, with top-notch service and support, which can ultimately save you time and money. So quality service is an investment that pays off in the real estate market, right? And again, you guys can manipulate this language in a way, but you want your messaging to be clear. I support you, buyer, client, but I also need to be paid for my efforts and you're paying for premium service. There's a reason why I stay in a five-star hotel versus a quality eight motel, right? Because the service level is different, right? Each one has a bed and a room and, you know, other amenities, if you want to call them that, a motel. But there's a reason why I would prefer to stay at this thing that takes great care of me versus this thing that is just a place for me to lay my head, right? Guys, I know I rushed through this last part. I'm always mindful of time. Um, how do we close this conversation? Uh, with a buyer, you know, I'm here to advocate for you, Kathy. So let's work together, you know, to make your home buying experience successful and enjoyable. Okay. Uh, are you ready to take the next steps with me as your trusted agent? Right. And that's asking for the business. 
That last statement is what we call asking for the business. If you're not asking for the business, there is no, there is nothing that enjoins your potential buyer to work with you because you haven't asked them for the business. And by having them sign a document, you know, that commits us to agree that we're working together successfully and we both have a common goal, okay? The key is to remain authentic, provide clear value and address each objection with understanding and evidence of how your service uh, services benefit the buyer. It's also important to be flexible and understand the buyers from the buyer's perspective, and you can always adapt your approach as needed, okay? Guys, as always, you know, um, and I'm going to steal an extra minute from you if you don't mind, but, you know, keep in mind, good agents provide hope and vision. Um, these two qualities keep your buyer engaged, even during tough times. People need to know that you are somebody they can trust and someone who inspires and knows how to get things done. As a buyer expert, the things that you should make a priority are always in managing the expectation. The reason why we have so many buyer complaints is we don't manage the expectation. A well-informed buyer is a happy buyer. The concierge experience starts with the buyer consultation, the pattern interview. And we can go into that in another session if you're not familiar with a pattern interview. Buyers love to buy but hate to be sold. So if you're going to employ scripting, don't just read it and think they're going to understand it because they're going to think you're selling them. Okay. Create a realistic time frame for the buyer to follow that falls under the managing the expectation. Um, establish a framework around the mechanics of the transaction, meaning let them know what they can expect. Let them know why they're signing these documents. Keep the buyer well informed so that the buyer is happy and not having to worry about it. That's a concierge experience. Okay. And eliminate house blur. Many of us just start to click auto send of houses that are on the market without much effort behind it. And the more you send, the less they're going to be able to make a decision. It creates inactivity, okay? And create an informed decision process um, for uh, making for the bu buyer so that you can eliminate unnecessary data. Guys, I hope this helped. I really appreciate your time and attention. Again, I know I rushed through this last part. We were kind of up against it on time. Make sure to email me so that I can send you a folder with all of the data that I discussed today. Um, my email address, obviously, d.wilmore at radiusagent.com. Um, you know, does anybody have any questions? We're about two minutes over. I apologize for the time gap. Anybody have any questions? Um, anything that they want to add before I let you all go? Awesome, guys. I hope this helped. Um, we will have uh, a session that, that uh, really kind of deep dives a little bit more into the um, lawsuit 